Well, hey there. Welcome to the Kim Constable podcast. I still haven't got used to saying that. I still want to say welcome to the Strong and Sculpted podcast. But I swear to God, a couple of weeks and I'll be totally fine and I'll be used to it. So welcome to the Kim Constable podcast, the podcast by me, Kim Constable, also known as the Sculpted Vegan and also the Million Dollar Mentor about all things to do with life, business and everything in between. How is that for a wee strap line? Just come up with that, you know, just in two seconds there. I might, thought I might have to stick for a few Sure. Um, anyway, how are you all? Nice to chat to you again. It is Sunday morning here in Belfast and I came to the office to record this podcast because I love Sundays in the office simply because it's quiet outside and it's quiet in the office and I get some headspace just to think and sit and connect with you guys. And I want to talk this week about, um, what I want to talk about? Well, it's kind of about feeling depressed actually. And you're like, Oh God, really, Kim? I'm going to slow the rest of this podcast. It's not about feeling depressed per se, but I have, I recognized yesterday, it's funny, I was sitting on the couch in the kitchen and I said to Ryan, do you know something? I actually just feel a little bit depressed. And he looked at me, he was on his phone beside me and he actually sat his phone face down and turned and looked at me square on and went, you feel depressed? Now, I understand we have just launched a new business, okay? The Million Dollar Mentor just launched last week. Um, we had a nightmare with the Facebook ads, so we didn't get as many people through the uh, the ads as we wanted, but we ended up selling um, 500 programs, which was half a million dollars in revenue. And, you know, from idea to launch in four weeks, you would say half a million dollars in revenue is is a pretty good turn. And I should be ecstatic by now because I have 500 new people to serve and, and this incredible new Facebook group. And not only do I have the Sculpted Vegan company, which is doing extremely well, I also have the Million Dollar Mentor. And I have four children and a beautiful husband. And life should be really, really sweet. So how the hell do I have the gumption to sit there and say, that I feel depressed. But, you know, it was actually quite liberating to say it because I'd been feeling it for a few days and I've been going through all of this self-judgment of, Kim, you do not have the right to feel depressed. Like, seriously, what is going on? I have not felt this. And Ryan goes to me, have you ever actually been depressed before? Like, do you know what the feeling is like? And I was like, well, I've never been like clinically depressed. But I remember whenever I was in school, I was 18. I was seriously, seriously run down, really badly run down studying for my A-levels. And I think I was probably partying too hard as well, to be honest. And I remember I kept crying and crying. And I, and I said to my mom one morning, I was like, mom, I just don't know what's wrong with me. And my mom is the kind of mom who was like, oh, for God's sake, buck up and get on with it, you know. She was like, well, I just don't know what to do with you. I mean, I, you know, well, just don't go to school then. Just go back to bed. Like my mom, my mom was not what the kind of, well, she is, she is wonderful, but she certainly wasn't the kind of mom who would have gone, oh, sweetie, you're not feeling well. Okay, let me call the doctor. Let me bring you some tea. No, my mom was like, you only got a day off school when we were younger if literally your arm was hanging off. Or mom would be like, go to school. And if you're still feeling sick in school, I'll come pick you up at break time. Um, and so I was just crying and crying this morning. I was like, mom, I don't know what's wrong with me. I am just so exhausted. And she was like, well, for God's sake, go back to bed then and take the day off school. And I was like, oh, I just wanted someone to give me a hug. I just felt like like I needed some sympathy. And anyway, so she ended up, I, I, my gums had started to bleed and stuff. And she ended up taking me to the dentist. And the dentist took one look at my gums and said, this child is absolutely and utterly exhausted. Her immune system is so compromised due to exhaustion that it's starting to make her gums recede and bleed. She needs to go home and get into bed and not move for two weeks. Of course, then my mum felt like a total bitch because I'd been crying for weeks and saying how tired I was. And that was the only other time in my life that I can ever remember feeling, you know, um, feeling kind of just mildly depressed. And I said this to Ryan and he was like, do you think there's a similarity between that situation and this one? Like, just saying, like, I, I don't know, like, I'm just, just, you know, just guessing here. There might be like some kind of similarity. And I was like, oh, yeah, right. Okay. I see your point. Sometimes we need those closest to us to point out things that we cannot see ourselves. So um, I just thought, you know what, today, I know that these, I'm always upbeating these podcasts and I swear a lot and whatever. And don't get me wrong, I am I am happy. I'm not like, listen, you're suicidal. This is not like my goodbye note, you know. <laughs> this is not like my eulogy to say goodbye to you all. But I thought um, I, it's really important to show not only the strong and upbeat and happy side of, you know, of what I do and of my life, but also to show you that I am actually human and there's another side to what goes on. And so I thought, you know what, I'm going to discuss today some of the things 
that um, have come up for me that have been going on since COVID-19 hit in March, because I know many, many people have been struggling with it. And I thought that maybe some of the stories I'm going to tell you today or some of the things I'm going to reveal to you may actually help you as well. So before we get into that, um, just a quick reminder that we do the monthly draw for the Strong and Sculpted podcast winner. Well, it's not, no, it's not the Strong and Sculpted podcast, for the Kim Constable podcast um, winner. All you have to do to win one of our Sculpted Vegan programs is simply to leave a review on the podcast wherever you listen to it and then send me a screenshot of that review. Here's a quick tip for you. If you leave the review on iTunes, sometimes once you have um, pressed submit, it can disappear <laughs> until until such time as iTunes decides to publish it. So take a re- take a screenshot of it before you click publish. Send it to me on Instagram as a direct message and you could go into the draw to win one of our strong and sculpted or sorry, one of our sculpted vegan programs which we announce every single month. We'll be announcing the next winner at the start of November. This is October, the 10th of October, so you still are 11th of October today. So you still have um some time to enter for October and we will choose the winner at the start of November. Okay, so let's get into today's podcast. Um, like I said earlier, you know, I said to my, I was sitting on the couch with Ryan yesterday and I was like, I just feel a bit depressed. And it was totally ludicrous, I felt, for me to be depressed. I didn't even want to say the words out loud because I understood just how absolutely insane they sounded because I have had a massively successful year in my business. And I know that many people are suffering from the effects of COVID-19. Many businesses have closed. Many people have lost their jobs. They're struggling for incomes. And I totally and utterly get the dichotomy of our situation, the juxtaposition of it. There are some people who have really come out on top and thrived, and then there are others in more vulnerable positions who have been really, really affected by the pandemic. And um, and I recognize that. And so because I guess I recognize that, I really felt like I had absolutely no right with everything that's happened in my business to feel anything but on top of the world because I have been working so hard and I have achieved enormous success. But um, the reason why I have achieved enormous success since March of this year um, is simply because of a decision that I made. It wasn't something that just happened to me. It wasn't something that um, that I woke up one day and I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Our business is doing so well. It was actually a decision that I made. So let me tell you about that decision. So in March this year, every year we usually run a live launch where we open up, publicly open up the Sculpt and Shred program. It's our signature 18-month program, which is $1,500. It's the only 18-month program that exists in the world today. And it literally sculpts your body from, you know, never having stepped foot in the gym to a stage athlete's body if you follow the plan step by step. And we usually open that up every year. The reason why we do a live launch, which is, you know, running a series of live master classes and then allowing people to purchase the program afterwards or join the membership is because it's a $1,500 program and that's a big investment for a fitness program. Many people will invest that in a business program or some kind of personal growth program, but not many people are willing to invest that in a fitness program. So I really want people to know, like, and trust me, which is why we run these live masterclasses so you can, you know, spend two hours with me and know that I really know what I'm talking about. And so this year we had our our live launch planned for March and everything had gone ahead. We had worked for it, worked hard towards it for the last six months. And every single thing that I earn, have earned over the last two years since I started the business has literally gone back into the business. Yes, I have paid myself well and I have managed to, you know, have some some great vacations and things, you know, through the business, through working in different countries and things, managed to combine, you know, work and, and business. But, um, you know, every single thing that I have earned, I have reinvested back into the company, into our growth. And so I... I didn't have a huge, I always rode the line of cash flow in the business. So I didn't have a huge amount of cash flow. I never built up huge cash reserves in the bank simply because I took a lot of risks to grow the business. I felt that it was better to grow the business and to take those risks and to have, um, to apply that money back into it rather than to, you know, arbitrarily build up money in the bank account. And 
And we have a lot of um, a lot of proof in the business that whenever we invest money in ads, we can you know double our turn, double our revenue. You know, whatever we invest, we make back. So we have a lot of proof over a couple of years that our business model works. That we can invest money in ads, invest money in videos and and graphics and all that kind of stuff, and and you know put them into Facebook ads and then make a return. So whenever this launch was coming up, I said to Vanessa, who runs my Facebook ads, I said to her, right, let's invest. I said, you know, sales is just a numbers game. This is one of the things that I teach inside the Million Dollar Mentor that basically whenever you run a masterclass, you will sell one to two percent of registrations, not of people who show up, not of, you know, any of that, but one to two percent of registrations. And people are shocked whenever they find out that it's so low. But I'm like, yeah, so if you have, you know, a hundred people register for your masterclass, you will sell one program. If you have, and it doesn't really matter the price of the program, it doesn't matter if it's 97, 197, or 997, the numbers stay true. And So it's the same as you have like a thousand people registered, you'll sell 10 programs. Sometimes if it's a really good offer, you'll sell 20, but usually 1% of registrations. So I said to Vanessa, let's pump a lot of money into these ads and get a lot of people registered because I know the numbers don't lie. So I said, so if we have, you know, 30,000 registrants, we should sell three to 600 programs. So three to 600 programs is 600 to a million dollars in revenue, 600,000 to a million dollars in revenue. So she was like, right, okay, let's do it. So we invested a hundred thousand pounds in Facebook ads, um, signing people up for the masterclass, and we had about thirty thousand registrants. We had four masterclasses we were running, and we had about thirty thousand registrants for the four masterclasses. And we were running them in March, I think it was, whatever date it was, mid-March, and everything was building up. The team had spent about six months putting it together. We had done an enormous amount of work for, you know, to bring the whole thing together. And I didn't actually have a hundred thousand pounds in cash sitting there in the bank account to pay off the ads if something had gone wrong. But there's no reason why anything ever would have gone wrong because we had been running these launches now for, you know, two to three years and we had a lot of proof in the business. And so I was very, very happy to invest that money knowing that we would make it back. And of course, what happened was we had 10,000 people registered for the first masterclass. And we got all geared up and I was here and it was exciting. And we were like, yay, and everything was going. And and then during the masterclass, whenever I logged on, there was only like 80 people on live. Now, I understand you will normally have about between 10 and 20% show up live. That's all. So if you have 10,000 registrants, you'll get like one to 2,000 people showing up live. And there was only about 100 people on. And I and I was like, what's wrong? You know, like this was like freaky wrong. There's no way with 10,000 registrants there would have been something wrong. And I was sending panicked messages to my team before we started saying, guys, is there something wrong? Is everything working? Can people get on? And they were like, yes, everything's okay. We're not sure. And they were like, maybe it's the corona- maybe it's, you know, the coronavirus. You know, it seems to be building, you know, get gathering speed. And, and you know, there have been kind of, people had been kind of talking about it more and it had been getting beginning to gather momentum worldwide. But um, anyway, the show must go on. I, I I went ahead and I ran the masterclass and I, I was, had so much energy and whatever. But I think during the masterclass, we had about between two and 300 people on live. And I was like, what is going, what is wrong? We didn't sell one single program live on the masterclass. And normally with 10,000 10, registrants, we would sell 50 to 100 programs live. People would purchase live on the masterclass and then continue to purchase afterwards. And I remember, um, so we, we ran this masterclass and I said to Courtney, who was my assistant at the time, I was like, Courtney, what? After we finished, I was like, what the hell? She said, oh my God, my friend just sent me this picture from Tesco. She said, Tesco was one of the supermarkets here. She said, look, and it wasn't a picture, it was a video. So she, her friend had gone to one of the biggest supermarkets here locally, and there was a queue of people the whole way round the supermarket. Now, we were running masterclasses here in Belfast at 8 p.m. and midnight because it suited time zones all over the world. And this was 11.30 11.30 on a Tuesday night and there were people queued the whole way around the supermarket with their trolleys stacked high with toilet paper and pasta and canned goods. People were panic buying in case we were going to be locked down and not, not you know, not be allowed out. And so the whole world, coronavirus literally hit the world or hit the places, certainly that buy my programs or that would show up to my masterclasses, hit on the Tuesday of my webinar. And I was like, oh my God, like what the hell are we going to do? And so anyway, we ran the two webinars. I think we only ended up selling like 
oh my goodness, like eight programs or something, um, you know, from all of those registrants. And then we ran another two the following Sunday. And I was just like, oh my God, oh my God, like no one was purchasing. We had, and normally I would have been like, okay, I would have been like, you know what, doesn't matter. We'll we'll figure it out. We'll do it again another time. But I had invested a hundred thousand pounds getting those people to the masterclass and I didn't have any way to pay that money off. And it was on and my American Express charge card. So it had to be paid off at the end of the month. There was no way to defer the payment or pay it off in chunks or no, this this bill needed paid off at the end of the month. And so anyway, what happened was we we ended up um, working really hard, pulling it out of the bag, turning it around, adding a home program, completely revamping the webinar. We ended up making my team work around the clock. We made some new videos. We put them out in new Facebook ads saying this was now a, because people were panicked because they couldn't go to the gym. This was the other thing. I was like, I was selling Sculpt the Body of a Physique Athlete on a vegan diet and nobody could go to the gym because the gyms were all closing. So um, we turned it around and we ran an extra masterclass on the Sunday, the, the following Sunday when everything had kind of calmed down a wee bit. People were obviously on lockdown, but they weren't as panicked as they had been before. And I think we ended up making about a quarter of a million dollars in total um, in the masterclass, which actually was absolutely astounding given, you know, given the situation. And it just shows how hard we worked to turn it around. Um, and also how much faith people had in me and in the program. So I, I thankfully could pay off that credit card bill and I was like, oh my God, you know, that was a massive weight off my mind because I've never not paid off a credit card bill. And uh, so anyway, so why am I telling you the story? So, well, what happened was after that, after the launch, I found myself in a really, really precarious situation. The business, yes, we had paid off the credit card bill, but that launch was supposed to bring in a massive amount of, amount of monthly recurring revenue. We were going to add, you know, about 600 people to our um, to the program. And we were going to, a lot of those would have been like 50% to 60% would have been monthly recurring revenue. So what happens is, you know, so say you open your program in March and then you have like a big chunk of them join in monthly recurring revenue. They pay, you choose to pay over 12 months. Well, the, a year later, their 12 month, their 12 payments have finished and all those people drop off in one big chunk. So that month, all of those people from the previous year were dropping off in one big chunk. And I needed to add that monthly recurring revenue back to my bottom line in order to keep the business solvent. And because that didn't happen, I find myself going, oh, my holy good God, what the hell am I going to do? Because the world was in such a precarious position. Nobody knew what was happening. There was no furlough scheme. There was no stimulus checks. There was, you know, the government hadn't stepped in to say what they were going to do. They had just shut everyone down. Businesses down, locked us down. They had shut everyone down and people were worried about their income. They were worried about their families. They weren't thinking about buying a bloody Sculpt and Shred program. They were worried about, did they have enough money to feed their bloody families? And I was respectful of that and I understood it. It wasn't like, oh, I can't believe that I haven't made another million this year. Like it wasn't anything like that for me at all. I was concerned for my own family. I was concerned for my, you know, I am the main breadwinner in the house now. My husband still earns a wage and we could live on his wage. Don't get me wrong, he earns a very good wage and we could live on it. But we we were used to a much higher standard of living since and our expenses were much higher and we have a lot of savings. So we were prepared to cut them back. But anyway, I was just, I was worried for myself as well. And so after the um, after the launch, whenever you know we, I I began to pick apart the books and looked at it, and I met with Jamie, my director of operations, and we really, really zoned in on the figures, and we were like, okay, what is going out? What is coming in? What's our monthly recurring revenue? Let's pull all these figures in, and let's really, really look at what we can do. And I remember sitting at my desk and I spent days and days and days on this and I just cried all the time because I had spent so, I had spent years building up this business and building this in incredible team and working so closely with everybody and this this network of people around the world that I had built up here were now dependent on me and I didn't want to let anybody down. But apart from anything, I had a hell of a lot of people on the payroll, people's jobs, people's livelihoods, feeding their families. Well, they were they were depending on me to pay their wages wages in order for them to be able to feed their families. And that's an, a massive responsibility. And I remember sitting down and looking at all of the contracts. I remember looking at all my team and thinking, right, okay, you know, who, if I had to let someone go, who would I let go? Like who is core to running the business? Who's not? And I was like, well, I couldn't let that person go because they're totally core. Couldn't let that person go because couldn't run the business without that person. Couldn't let that person go because, you know, so it was like, we don't, we, we have a very lean uh, company in terms of we have a small but mighty team. It's not like we have a huge amount of extra superfluous people that we could let go. My team are very, very core to what it is that we do. 
And I have, I was looking, you know, going, okay, I can't let that person go. Right. What about this person? No, I can't let that person go either. What about this person? We were looking at all these contracts and it was a really, really, really stressful time. And I would sit here in the office and, and then I would go home at night and I would, I would stay late just trying to salvage something out of something out of nothing, looking at all the angles and all the ways. And, and my mindset was really focused on how I could save the team, how I could save the company. So it was, it was on, on damage control. My mindset that was totally and utterly on damage control. Okay. I was, I was in my mind, I had decided that the business was probably going to go under, or it was at least going to go through a really, really, really difficult time. And we either had to manage through the difficult time as best we could, or I had to accept the fact that the company was going to go under and that I was going to have to start again at some point or whatever. This, this was my mindset and this is how I was viewing everything. And I remember going home then I think the masterclass was on the Sunday and then I didn't have any break. Normally I have a, a, a break after a launch. The last one was on the Sunday. I normally have a break after the launch. Didn't have a break. Just was straight back in here trying to figure all this out. Worked all day Sun, all day Monday, all day Tuesday. And I remember going home at eight, about 8 p.m. on Tuesday night. I went into the house and Ryan was sitting listening to music and he said, you know, do you want to have a couple of beers? And I said, yes, I absolutely do want to have a couple of beers. So I, um, anyway, I went, uh, He we had a couple of drinks and I literally sank one and then I sank the next one. I was just trying to numb the pain and then I sank another one. And after about four, the pain started to go away. And I was like, okay, I feel a wee bit better now. So I had some dinner and then we went to bed and we watched a movie and I fell asleep about midnight. And of course, whenever you fall asleep after you've had a couple of drinks, you never sleep very well. And I remember waking up at 2 p.m. 2 a.m. And I was lying in bed and I tried to get back over to sleep. But the minute that I woke up, it was about 2.30, I think 2.30 a.m. The minute I woke up, my brain went into overdrive of thinking about the business, thinking about the people, thinking about, you know, all the different things. And I thought, you know what, I cannot sleep. I'm just going to get up. And so I got up and I went downstairs and I got my computer and I sat in front of the fire in the living room. The fire was already was lit from earlier on anyway. And I opened my computer and I thought, I'm going to start, I'm going to pick apart all, all of the different finances of the business again. So I went into all of my monthly recurring revenue. I went into my business accounts. I went into all of the money that was in the bank account, what was coming in. I, I worked out projections moving forward. I looked at, you know, how long could we survive? We could, I realized that with our current cash flow, we could survive three months. Three, if we didn't make another penny, we could survive three months before the business, you know, would, would have to go under if there was no more money coming in. Because at this point I was thinking, you know, I want, I, people aren't going to be able to buy our programs. No one's going to have any money. So I was still in this damage control mindset. And then I, I sat for a minute and I, and I actually cried. And I remember having a really big cry. And then something happened after I cried. And I, I stopped for a second and I thought, you know what? I thought, fuck this shit. I am sick of feeling this way. I have felt this way for two and a half weeks now. And I am a happy and positive person. And I am so fed up feeling this way. And I asked myself, what would happen if I just decided to change, to change my mindset? What would happen if I just decided, if I made the decision to focus on something else? Because one of the things that I do know for sure is that we choose our thoughts. We choose our thoughts and we choose how we react to things. The, uh, what's the saying that I love? Um, freedom lies in the capacity to pause between stimulus and response. So a stimulus comes in, coronavirus hits, and my response is, I'm going to, you know, like I, I focus on the negative or I get, I get upset or I cry or it makes me feel negative in some way. And so I thought to myself, I thought, no, I, I'm going to have to change this. I thought, let's, there must be positives. There must be positives in this pandemic, right? Where are the positives? Let's look. So I opened my computer and I started, I, I asked Google about, you know, the coronavirus, you know, positives or good things, you know, to do with coronavirus pandemic. And what started to come up in my newsfeed was all of the different, um, some people had written articles on, you know, the 10 positive things to come out of the coronavirus. And it was, you know, China is now starting to open back up and they're starting to do this and this and this. And then they started showing the canals in Italy, in Venice, where it was like, you know, dolphins are now starting to swim in the canals and they're cleaner than they've ever been. And, you know, and, and it started to show wildlife, you know, coming out and this and smog lifting, you know, there's no smog over New York or, and it started to show all of the, effects that the coronavirus was having on the natural world and how it was actually helping to heal the natural world. And I thought to myself, what if 
something like this is necessary every so often to shake us up. What if I could turn this around and turn this into an opportunity for me and an opportunity for the business? And I thought there must be opportunity here. There must be opportunity. And I thought to myself, you know, let's find the opportunity because in every crisis there is opportunity. And if you think about like all of the companies at the minute who are making personal protection stuff and also like the Perspex, you know, uh, screens and things that they're putting up, you know, everywhere you go now, there's a Perspex screen between you and the person behind the counter. Like those companies are thriving. I bet you they, ne they never expected to thrive, but they're all thriving during the pandemic. And I thought there's people who are thriving during this pandemic. There are people who... Companies that have a massive amount of opportunity, where is my opportunity? And I began to think, well, how is it that I'm feeling? The first thing that I do whenever I I want to try on how my customer might be feeling or look for opportunity for my customer that I can better serve them, the first thing I do is I try on how am I feeling? And so I asked myself, how is it that I'm feeling? And I began to write all these, all these things down. I was like, I'm feeling scared. I'm feeling upset. I'm feeling um, I'm feeling like I, you know, I'm worried about money. Uh, my gym is closed and I'm worried I'm going to lose all my hard-earned muscle. I am, you know, scared for my children. I'm worried. We homeschool anyway, so it didn't matter to them to be at home. Nothing in our home life changed. In fact, it was just wonderful because we ended up, you know, being at home more and playing more games. Well, I wasn't, but Ryan was at home more. I was working all the time. But I began to really look for where is the opportunity here. And as I tried on how I was feeling, I thought to myself, this is how the rest of the world must be feeling. And one of my greatest strengths in life is helping people to feel better. Helping people to feel better. And I don't do it by going, oh, Gucci cool, you know, Kim's here to powder your belly, you know, powder your butt and blow a raspberry on your belly. I do that too sometimes. But I also just, I, I make programs and support groups and Facebook groups and all different things that support people. And so I help people to feel better through support, through giving them something to focus on, through giving them a, a program that works, that helps them to have more of what they want in their life, whether that be financial success, whether it be, you know, losing body fat, whether it be building muscle, whether it be, you know, feeling better through food or through yoga or through, you know, detoxing their bodies. Like I, all of my programs and all of my businesses I've created have been geared towards helping people to feel better, to have more, build more and to feel better. And so I thought to myself, there must be an opportunity here. And I still couldn't see what the opportunity was. But once I shifted my mindset, something happened. And I said to myself, you know what? I am not going to let one single member of my team go. And I made that decision. I was like, I, if, if I have to pay them out of my own bank account, there is not one member of my team is going to get fired because they are my family. And asking which one of my family I would let go is, or asking which one of my team I would let go is like asking me which one of my children I would sacrifice. I would not sacrifice one of my children over the other. And I will not sacrifice one of my team members over the other. And once I made that decision, it felt so solid in my body and I felt so good about that decision. And I closed my computer, it was about an, an hour or two hours later, and I went up to bed and I got into bed and I slept so soundly for the rest of the night. And I woke up in the morning and Ryan woke up and he was beside me and I said to him, oh, I was up, you know, most of the night. And he said, oh, were you? And he said, are you okay? And I said, I was just looking at all different parts of the business. And I said to him, I, I've made a decision. And he said, well, what is it? And I said, I'm not letting anyone go. And he said, but how, how is that possible, Kim? You know, your, your business only has enough cash to survive for three months. And I said, I don't care, Ryan. I am not letting anyone go. I cannot choose between my team. I cannot choose to sacrifice one over the other. I can't. It would be like asking me to sacrifice one of my children. And he said, well, I believe in you. He said, whatever. You've never, ever let yourself down. Everything you said you're going to do, you've, you've done up until now. I believe in you. And so I... um. I came into the office and I chatted with the team that day and I, and I shared my decision with them and I said, I don't know how this is, how I'm going to do this, but I, there's, I'm not, he said, not one of you is, is being let go. And they were great. They offered like to take, you know, pay cuts and, you know, 20% pay cuts or even 50% pay cuts or whatever for, you know, a month or two months or whatever. And, and I said, I really appreciate it, but I'm not that, I'm not asking anyone to take a pay cut and I'm not asking any, I'm not going to let any of you go. I am going to figure this out. And so what had happened was because I, because I started to try on how people 
were feeling, but how I was feeling and how other people might be feeling, I realized that that I understood how I could best serve, how I could best serve, right? And and it was the mindset shift that I needed because truly what I needed in that moment was a mindset shift. I needed a shift of perspective and I needed to make a decision because one of my favorite sayings is where your thoughts go, energy flows. And up until that point, I'd been focusing on the negative. I'd been focusing on the the downsides. I'd been focusing on crisis management. I'd been focusing on what was going to happen if I had to close the business. And so that's where all my energy was going. Once I made the perceptual shift and I shifted my thinking away from the negative and into the positive, everything started to change. And later on that day, as I was training, I came up with the idea for a program called the Jailhouse Shred. And this was simply as a result of me making a shift in my thinking. And how it happened was I had, um, we have some gym equipment at home because the kids have, you know, PT sessions. And I had gone into, you know, our very rudimentary home gym and I had assessed the equipment that I have there. And I looked around and I picked up some dumbbells and I was curling dumbbells and I was, you know, doing like a shoulder workout, you know, with these very inadequate dumbbells. And I was thinking, oh, this just isn't enough. Like I want to be in the gym. It's not even, and I was like, okay, why do I want to be in the gym? And I was like, well, I want to be in the gym because, you know, I work hard and it's, and it's, it makes me feel alive and I feel like I can push and I can beast it. And, and I just don't believe that these dumbbells are, are making me, you know, grow any muscle. I don't believe that they're actually working. And I started to really question my process. Like, what is it about about this that I'm not enjoying? And how is it, more importantly, that I want to feel? What is it that I want from a program? What is it that I want from having to train from home? And then I got this idea. I was like, okay, hang on a wee second. If this is how I'm feeling, this must be how the rest of the world is feeling. And so I thought there must be people in the world that are jacked. There must be people in the world that are jacked and they don't have any access to equipment. And I thought, you know, that where are these people? And so later on that day, I pulled on my computer and I started Googling. I was like the most jacked people in the world. And what came up was prison inmate Charles Bronson. Many of you have heard me talk about this before, about how I came up with the idea of the jailhouse shred. And And it really just came from me understanding what it was that I wanted, what I needed from a gym program. I needed something that was going to guarantee me that I was going to build muscle or keep the muscle that I had that was going to make me feel like I had worked really, really hard, that I was going to gain a better skill or another skill, or it was going to challenge me in a way that I hadn't been challenged before, like pull-ups and push-ups and things are not part of my normal training routine. But it is something that, you know, you feel very accomplished. If you can, you know, get down on the ground and bang out 30 full press-ups, you feel very accomplished. Same with pull-ups. You know, a lot of women can't do pull-ups. I, I can do pull-ups because I'm very strong, but, you know, like how many pull-ups could I do? And, and you know, it's, it's something that, um, you know, there's a bit of an ego as well there that you could just like anywhere at all in front of people, like jump up on a bar and just like start pulling yourself up and doing, you know, doing pull-ups. And so I that that began to excite me. And so I, I began to Google and I come up with, you know, and Google gave me the name of Charles Bronson, one of the strongest men in the world, holds many world records for strength. And he's been in solitary confinement for 33 years. And I was like, the man has been in solitary confinement with no access to equipment for 33 years. And he holds world records for strength. And I thought to myself, if Charles Bronson can do it, so can I. And so I began to research prison inmates and I saw, you know, uh, Mike Tyson and I began to watch these videos of of all these different, you know, of, of prisoners, of prison inmates basically doing these insane, you know, pull-ups and push-ups and curls and, and being absolutely jacked to the hilt and using their time in recreation and using their time whenever they were outside to be like gladiators, you know, to to really push hard and to build strength and to, to make themselves physically fitter and strong in so many ways. And I saw, you know, videos of, of people who'd completely transformed their bodies. They'd gone into prison overweight and unhealthy and they'd come out of prison healthy and, and, and fitter and stronger and of a completely different mindset, more importantly. And I thought to myself, 
This is the key. Even though we are not in prison, and understand, I am not disrespecting anyone who is incarcerated in any way. I got a lot of flack for uh, for creating the jailhouse shred. You know, people called me racist and white supremacist and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, no, no, understand. The intent was never that. It didn't even enter my mind. And I am so far from a racist, you wouldn't even believe. But, um, and also here in Ireland, it's not as prevalent as as it is in the States, for sure. You know, it's, and so, you know, people, I got a lot, I got a lot of flack for it anyway, but that didn't bother me because truly I know my intent is good. So people can say anything they want about me, but my intent is always good. And I just thought we are thrust into a situation that we do not understand, that we have never been in before. We find ourselves, you know, at home with no access to equipment. We cannot go out. Everything is closed. Our life as we knew it has completely changed changed for the foreseeable future, what, you know, how would I want to feel coming out of this? And I knew that I would want to feel positive and strong and mentally together and all of those things. And so from the research that I did into prison inmates, I created the Jailhouse Shred. Now, the Jailhouse Shred ended up uh, selling 2,000 copies in the first seven days after we launched. We went from idea on that on that Monday morning, I think it was, or Tuesday morning or Wednesday morning. Sorry, it was a Tuesday night. I'd been up, um, and then I had the idea for the jailhouse shred on a Wednesday. Okay, a Wednesday, and we we went from idea from I had that idea to launching the program two and a half weeks later. We launched. Uh, not the following Monday, not the Monday after, but the Monday after that. We launched from idea to launch in two and a half weeks. Now, when I say idea to launch, what I mean is I wrote the program. We recorded all the videos. I recruited Ninja Warrior, um, a guy called Paul Allen here in Belfast. He's been a finalist in UK Ninja Warrior twice. Um, he owns a parkour gym. I recruited him to do the videos with me because he is a calisthenics and bodyweight expert um, and to help me devise the program. I wrote the program. We recorded the videos. My team, Alan, uh, he did the graphics and all of and built out, you know, the the, the web pages. Alison, my copywriter, did all of the emails and the sales page. Mark did all of the videos and the teaser videos. And it was and everybody pulled together. And Jamie, of course, you know, timed everything, not timed everything, but put everything into Infusionsoft and pulled everything together and scheduled the entire launch idea to launch in two weeks. We were absolutely and utterly exhausted afterwards, but we sold 2,000 copies in the first week. And that $200,000 in revenue pulled me out of a financial hole and showed me that this was something that people really, truly needed and wanted. And, you know, and of course, by this point, there was different furlough schemes. People had more money. They were beginning to realize that they weren't spending all the money they'd been spending before and they were actually saving money. And so they could invest a small amount of money in something like this that was going to help their mental, emotional and physical well-being. But here's the point that I'm trying to make. Not that, oh my God, I made so much money, but here is here is the, the true point of what I'm saying. I could never have come up with the idea for the jailhouse shred if I didn't have a deep understanding of what drives me first and foremost, and therefore what drives other people. Because human beings are basically the same. I'm the same as you. You're the same as that person beside you. If you're walking or or driving your car or in the gym listening to this, you are the same. We are basically the same. We have the same emotions. We have the same thoughts. We have the same feelings. And we have the same reactions in different situations. And even if you... Um, even if you don't, if you've never experienced a situation that someone is in, you can try them on and you can imagine how you would feel if you were in a similar situation. Or you can take a situation that you've been in that has been similar, try on how that person must feeling and have a deeper understanding and empathy for them. Trying someone on basically involves putting yourself in their situation and imagining how you would feel if you were them. Now, this is easier for women as we are naturally more empathetic because we are allowed to be and taught to be as kids that it's okay to be in tune with your emotions, to feel your emotions, to understand your emotions, to express your emotions. Men usually have to work harder for the same understanding simply because whenever they're little boys, as they're brought up, they're, they're you know, as I've talked about loads in this podcast, men are taught all these lessons such as, you know, big boys don't cry and pull up your big boy pants and shut up and get on with it. And, you know, they have this understanding that you, you know, work is something which is very results based and having an emotional reaction to something doesn't get you out of doing the job. And so therefore they get, they get used to cutting themselves off from their emotions and, you know, seeing themselves as a tool, almost a tool to earn money, look after their family, to move heavy stuff, all of this kinds of thing, all of these kinds of things. And so therefore they don't naturally have the same empathetic understanding that women do. It's not to say that they don't have it because my boys are extremely empathetic because that's how I brought them up. I haven't brought them up to have any of those lessons that they, and because they've never gone to school, 
And their friends are, I I choose, well, I don't choose their friends for them, but I definitely monitor who they are friends with. I don't allow a lot of that social conditioning to seep into our family. So my boys are extremely empathetic. They kiss and hug me all the time. Like my 15-year-old comes and gets into bed beside me. And if he's upset about something and he cries, he has a massive big cry whenever he needs to. He has no shame in coming in and sharing something that upset him or something he's struggling with and having a great big cry about it. And um, with me sitting with my arms wrapped around him and him pouring his tears out onto my chest because I have protected him from ever believing that that is bad. And so he's extremely in tune with his emotions, but he's also extremely masculine. So it's a beautiful balance. But um, so anyway, women have an easier time with empathy than men do. Um, but I could never have come up with the idea for the jailhouse shred if I didn't have that deep, deep understanding and that deep, deep empathy for people. But and then t- took that deep understanding and empathy for myself and for others and applied it to a positivity, applied it to a shift in mindset. So the, the thing that came first was the shift in mindset where I decided to not focus on the negative anymore. It was a conscious decision that I made to look for the positivity, to look for the opportunity. There is opportunity in every single negative situation if you will only look for it and focus on it. And then once I I made that decision and I began to put my energy into that I started noticing all of the information or, or or opening myself up to all the information that came in that supported that point of view. And then, of course, once I, I applied that to a deep understanding for people, the jailhouse shred was a very, very natural progression. It wasn't something I had to force. It wasn't something I had to really push at or work at or try to figure out. It flowed very naturally for me once I tuned into those skills that I have of positivity and empathy. Trying someone on is a skill that you have to learn. But if you learn this skill, it will absolutely transform your relationship with your kids, your relationship with your spouse. Um, It'll transform your working relationships. It'll transform how you run a business, your ability to be able to connect with your customers. Um, And it'll also just transform your experience of yourself. And I know that it's something that, you know, I have worked very hard on over the years. And it's something that Ryan, my husband, is actually working on at the minute too. He definitely as a professional rugby player and, um, you know, being nearly 50, definitely grew up in a, you know, and he's actually, although he's Australian, he's South African actually by birth. Um, he, he lived in South Africa. He was born and raised in Durban until he was 12 or 13. And then he went to Australia. So he considers himself Australian and he has an Australian passport, but he was actually born in South Africa. So all of his primitives that he built as a child are South African. And South African men are very it's a very male dominated culture and it's very, I don't know a lot about South African, so apologies if you're South African and you're like, no, Kim, that's totally not true. But from what I have learned um, or what I understand, the, the men are the head of the family and they are, men are supposed to be men. And there's a lot of this, you know, you, d- you don't cry and you don't show a lot of emotion and you, of course, there's exceptions to every rule, but that is the, the culture that Ryan was brought up in. And so he has a lot of that himself. And then being a professional rugby player, he got hurt a lot, of course, on the rugby field and he had to really push through, you know, hard, hard, hard training sessions and playing in all kinds of weather and and you know a lot of the 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 ribbing that goes on between the boys. You become very, very hard as a rugby player, and so Ryan would be very hard on himself, but he would also be very, very hard on me. And having empathy for me and not treating me as um, one of the things that we've had to really come through in our relationship is I am very masculine in my energy. And, but, you know, I'm also you know, like I'm a, I'm a bodybuilder. A lot of what I do is masculine. I'm a bodybuilder. I'm the main breadwinner in the house now. I earn more money than my husband. I um, I am very physically strong, emotionally strong. So I have a lot of male tendencies. And one of the things that we struggle with is Ryan, or even though I am female and I am his wife, he will treat me like one of the boys sometimes. And I'm kind of like, I know that I am very, very masculine many times, but I do need you to treat me like a woman. I need you to treat me as your wife and I need you to recognize that I am vulnerable and that I do get upset and that I am not one of the boys, you know, and I need I need you to treat me differently. And I guess um, uh, one of the things that he realized recently or something that came up for us was we, we both work with a coach every week. So um, we both have have a personal coach, like a life coach, if you like. And um, it's the same woman who coaches both of us. And she's absolutely phenomenal. 
And Ryan was working with her recently and he was he shared with me that he was he was feeling angry with me recently. Now not not angry as in like I'm gonna fucking kill her, but just angry as in kind of resentful of me a little bit because I've been on a shred recently. And whenever I'm on a shred, it involves, you know, low calories, two hours of cardio a day, and um you know, and, and just and a lot of focus, you know, sauna sessions every night, that kind of stuff, very to lose body fat in a very short space of time. So I give myself six weeks. In the end, our vacation was cancelled. So I pushed it out to 10 weeks so that I could do the photo shoot next Friday. But it takes an, a huge amount of time and energy whenever I'm doing a shred. And he was feeling angry um, and a bit resentful towards me recently because I'm also, we also launched a new business, The Million Dollar Mentor. And that took up a huge amount of energy and time for me. And then, of course, at the same time as I, you know, as I was running the business, I was doing a shred. And he kept saying to me, why are you doing, why are you dieting? Why are you doing a shred at the same time as, as starting this business? Because both of them take up a huge amount of time in and of themselves. But together, they're completely and utterly draining you. And I, and in truth, I wasn't drained at all, but it was taking up a huge amount of time. And I just kept saying to him, you know what, Ryan, I, I don't, I can't even explain it to you. When I'm doing loads of cardio, you know, when I'm focused, I'm focused. Like, and I'm using the focus of of launching the new business to drive the shred as well. Like, when I when I'm focused in one area, I'm focused in all areas. And I had over the last, I would say, eight weeks, I have had extreme focus, extreme, extreme focus. Now that I never let my home life suffer because of that. Of course it does sometimes because I'm not lying in bed at night watching movies with Ryan. I don't come to bed till 10 o'clock and that's after my last set of cardio. And so, you know, but I, I spend every weekend with the kids. I spend weekends with Ryan and I, I really make sure that nothing suffers. What actually suffers is seeing my friends and my family. I don't usually see my extended family or my friends a lot whenever I'm extremely focused, but I never, ever, ever let time be sacrificed with my children or with my husband. Um, and so the three things I've been taking up all of my time recently are the Sculpted Vegan, running the Sculpted Vegan, run, um, four things actually, launching the Million Dollar Mentor, doing my shred and spending time with my family. But he was feeling resentful towards me because I decided to do this shred in the middle of launching, you know, a new company and it was time away from the family and it meant life was harder for me than it needed to be and therefore life was harder for him than it needed to be. And he just couldn't understand why I was doing this. And, you know, he was kind of, punishing me a little and feeling angry, not definitely not being like 100% supportive, not being unsupportive, but just not feeling 100% supportive. And so he worked with his coach on it. And then he sat down and he said to me, one night he said, I had an absolutely mind blowing session today. And I said, really? I said, you know, what happened? And he said, you know, I've been feeling angry with you. And I said, you've been angry with me? Like he hit it so well, I didn't even know. And he said, yeah, I've been feeling angry with you. I've been feeling resentful. And he said, because I just couldn't understand why you were focusing on doing the shred at the same time as doing the, um, as, you know, as launching the new business. And he said, but, you know, what I recognize now is, he said, I was able to really try you on. And he said, I was able to try you on from the perspective of when I was was growing my business, because Ryan is a director in a global company. He started his own sports management company after he retired from professional rugby. And then about 10 years, maybe eight years ago, he merged it, maybe only six years, actually, he merged it with um, other companies to form a global brand. So his company is called Esportif. And he said, I remember whenever I was starting the business, he said, and I was absolutely 100% focused on the business, he said, but it wasn't even for the fact of it, of me being focused on the business for the sake of the business, because of course that was it. He said, you know, I felt a huge amount of responsibility to my clients, to the people that I represent and, and all of that. He said, but I, he said, more than anything, I felt a huge financial responsibility to the family and to you he said because I you weren't working you were raising the kids and you know you were stay-at-home mom and I wanted to provide well for you and I wanted to give you that financial security that you really wanted and I wanted to be able to provide well for you and he said to me and I realized that you you must feel the same he said, not only, he said, you know, he said, you know, because Ryan has always wanted to have, you know, a lot of money in savings and, you know, to feel very, it's very important to him that he did not grow up with a lot of money and his mom didn't work and his dad um, worked very, very hard, but there was five kids in the family and 
he did not grow up with a lot of money, so financial security is very important to him, and it's something he's worked really hard for all his life, and, and I know it's important to him, and I have worked really, really hard to give him financial security, and we we are very financially secure now, but, and I, so because that's so important to him, I've wanted him to have more of what he wants, and so that's part of the reason why I've been working so hard, and he said, I never realized that not only do you want, not only do you have the financial responsibility now of, of carrying the family, he said, you also, you know, carry a lot of your own family financially like I I I I give a lot of money to Ryan's family in Australia and you know I provide for them and I I provide for my own family um in many ways financially and so he said you have a huge amount of financial responsibility on you which I didn't recognize and he said and also you um he said what I didn't realize is he said your body is your business and I said Yes, Ryan, it is. He said, you know, people are constantly looking at you on Instagram. They're following you. He said, they're critiquing you. If you're in a bikini and you're not looking good and you've got cellulite, someone could splash that on Instagram. Or, you know, he said, you're, you know, he said, that's why you get Botox and fillers and hair extensions and tan and nails. And he said, because your image is very much wrapped up in your business and your business is what provides for our family. And honestly, whenever he said it to me, I just burst into tears because I felt like he truly, for the first time, understood me and he understood where I was coming from. Because, you know, people say to me all the time, they love to judge on Instagram and go, oh, she's so narcissistic. Oh, she's like, she's so concerned with her image. And, you know, and all of these fucking wankers on uh, tattle.com, <laughs> you know, the sculpted vegans are so interested in how she looks and look at her chipped and peeling windrow ledges. And I'm like, yeah, we're knocking our house down next year. I'm not going to spend 10 grand pet painting the outside of the house whenever we're going to knock the damn thing down. That would just be very silly. You dickheads <laughs> is what I really want to say to them. But, um, I felt like he had uh, he had finally understood me because it's true. Like my body is my business. My how I look is my business. My business, my core business, is called the sculpted vegan. I am the sculpted vegan. Call me narcissistic or not, or say she's so up herself or whatever the fuck you want to say about me. It is true. But apart from anything else, my business provides financially for the for provides the livelihoods for everybody who works for me and also for my extended family, you know, and and I have a massive amount of responsibility on my shoulders. And for him to judge me because I had decided to do a shred was so small minded into what, you know, he saw and what was important for him. And, oh, well, I'm missing, you know, and this is, I'm just projecting, this is what he was thinking, but, you know, like I'm, oh, I'm, I'm feeling so hard done by because Kim's not here in the evening to, you know, to, to, to make me a bagel if I'm hungry or to take care of me as well, or to make me, you know, or just to be here and spend time with me. You know, he loves spending time with me. And listen, if Ryan ever heard me say it, he'd be like, what the fuck you talking about making me a bagel in the evening you're talking through your hole I don't mean that anyway but you know he was like oh I just want her to be here with me and what he didn't realize was the reason why I work so hard the reason why I do what I do is because I have a huge amount of responsibility in my brand and my business and and everything that I do and and whenever he told me that and he explained to me how he was finally able to try me on through his own perspective and his own experience it completely and utterly blew my mind and it shifted his perspective into what i was doing and because here's the thing that i want that i want to teach you guys is that everyone is fighting their own battle people rarely rarely have bad intent they're they're just doing the best they can and they're doing what they believe is right i always remember um hearing about gandhi when he was asked uh, when he had been incarcerated and he was being tortured somebody asked him do you hate the people who are doing this to you? And he answered, no, I don't. And the person said, how is this possible? And he said, "He's they're only doing what they believe is right. And I remember being blown away by that and thinking, what a perspective. He didn't blame the people who were torturing him because he said they were doing what they believed was right. And how can you, how can you blame someone for doing what they believe is right? Now, their acts were bad, but they in of themselves were just doing what they believed was right. And it blew my mind that he could have so much compassion for those who were torturing him. And it, if you take it, scale it right back to the story I just told, you know, in some small way, Ryan was being tortured by the fact that I was, you know, so focused on shredding and so focused on growing the business and 
I was taking time away from him, from the kids and all that. It was bothering him. But once he actually took the time to try me on, just like I tried on the people who were suffering through the pandemic, you know, and was able to come up with the jailhouse shred, once Ryan tried me on, it it completely and utterly shifted his perspective. It shifted his perspective. But one of the things that Ryan has has been working on an enormous amount is having more compassion for himself, not seeing himself as a tool to be used to, you know, father the family or earn money or lift heavy stuff or whatever it is that we believe men are tools for. Because women are so bad at this. Like we really treat our men like tools. We see them as, you know, people there to open doors for us and lift our cases and and look after us financially and discipline the children and all of these things. You know, we and men do it to women as well, but we do see men as as tools, and we buy into this this notion that they um, that they are just utilitarian and they don't have any emotions, they don't have any feelings, and all the rest of it. And it's not true; they do. They're just used to burying them. But Ryan has been working on having a huge amount of compassion for himself recently, and you can only have compassion for others to the extent to which you allow yourself to feel compassion for your own struggle, compassion for others first comes from having compassion for self. And if you are hard on yourself and you punish yourself mercilessly for not living up to some impossible standard, you will punish others for the same. I actually have a friend, um, a girl I used to do business with years ago, and she uh, she's now running her own business here in Belfast. And she's constantly asking me, you know, how did you find your team? How do you keep your team? How do you not, you know, she goes, I never seem to be able to, you know, find good people. And I said to her, we, we met actually for coffee a few weeks ago, and I said to her, the, I said, can I be really candid with you? And she said, yeah. And I said, the issue is you're too hard on yourself. And she was like, eh? And I said, you're too hard on yourself. You are massively hard on yourself. You have an enormously high expectations of yourself and your own performance. So therefore, you have massively high expectations of those who work for you. I said, it's okay to have high expectations because I have very high expectations of those who work for me, but I don't punish them when they don't live up to my expectations, and you do. I said to her, you punish the people who work for you whenever they make a mistake or whenever they don't perform or whenever something goes wrong or they're late or they they drop the ball or they make a mistake in the business. You punish them and you are angry with them and you're huffy with them and you tell them off and you ask them how they're going to fix it. And your, your intent is to make them feel bad about what they did. She was like, well, how else are they going to learn? I said, people don't learn through punishment. That's why she cannot keep staff because she's constantly punishing punishing others. But the reason she's constantly punishing others is because she punishes herself. And she was probably punished as a child quite mercilessly, I would imagine. So therefore, she has linked um, performance and punishment. So she punishes herself. And I said to her, you need to stop punishing yourself. You need to be more gentle with yourself when you make a mistake. You need to stop being so vested and things going exactly the way you want them to be. You need to be less of a control freak. And just chill out and laugh. And you know what I do when things go wrong in my company? I laugh. I laugh. Like we we put up a we put up this the most horrendous spelling mistake by mistake. Nobody saw it last week during our ads crisis. And we put up you know f- the word fron fron mama four to online empire owner f r o n n for Norman, not M for mother. It was a glaringly obvious mistake. And see, we know what we what I did whenever we realized that it had gone out and we'd spent thousands of pounds in ads on it and people were like commenting, commenting on it. I laughed. I laughed. And the whole team laughed. And Alan, who had done it, you know, put up this thing saying, I am dyslexic, I am dyslexic, I am dyslexic. And we all laughed about that too. Like, you know, I don't get too vested. Like, really, what actually happened that was bad? Really, what happened that was bad? You know, a spelling mistake went up and people went, oh my God, the million dollar mentor can't spell. Yeah, so the fuck what, right? And then other people looked at it and went, oh well, must have been a spelling mistake. Shit happens. (laughs) Mistakes happen in life. So you just got to learn to chill out and not get so vested and so controlling in things being a certain way and realize at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter as much as you think it's going to matter. So, you know, and it's important to know whenever you just need a little bit of self-love and a little bit of TLC and to bring it back to, you know, and, and to be more gentle with yourself, to bring it back to the original point of the this whole podcast, which was I sat there saying to Ryan, I just feel a little bit depressed. And I really felt like I had no right to be depressed. But here's what I realized talking about compassion and compassion for yourself and compassion for others. 
is that I cannot teach others that they should have compassion for themselves if I am not willing to have compassion for myself. No matter what I believe about myself, I am a human being. I am a 41-year-old mother of four. Yes, I have a lot of masculine energy. I have a lot of, um, I am I am very at cause with my emotions. I have a lot of amazing state control that even if I'm feeling upset or angry or anxious, I can just transition out of it and still live my life. But at the end of the day, I am human. And what I've realized is that we have pushed and pushed and pushed since March. We we worked so hard after Christmas to push the Sculpt and Shred launch. We managed to pull it out of the bag and then we went straight into the Jailhouse Shred launch. And then we went straight into the Butt Camp launch, which we did. And then I, I only had, I say only, many people haven't even had a vacation in between. I managed to squeeze a five-day vacation in the middle of it. But normally I would try and go away at the end of every launch just to completely hit the reset button. But I haven't had a chance to do that. And then we went straight into the Million Dollar Mentor launch, which was four weeks from from idea to launch as well. And so no matter how much money I am making, no matter how much the money the company makes, no matter how much, you know, success we have or whatever, I have I am human and I can only push so much before I break. And I almost recently reached breaking point. I was emotionally physically and mentally exhausted. And so this weekend, I guess, has been very cathartic for me in many ways because I, rather than judging myself or trying to pretend that it's not that way or saying I shouldn't feel this way because I have this or this or this or there's many people that are worse off than me in the world. When did that ever make anyone feel better, by the way? Have you ever said, oh my God, I'm so whatever? And people go, well, there's starving children in Africa. And you're like, yeah, that really doesn't make me feel better. So, you know, rather than do that to myself, I have allowed myself to feel the full depth of exhaustion because I am exhausted and the full depth of um, everything that I have taken on since March. And I guess to sit back a little bit and congratulate myself on the fact that I didn't lay off one single member of staff. And not only did I not lay them off, I have actually, we have we have taken on four new members of staff, four or five, five new members of staff since coronavirus pandemic. So not only have I not laid off any staff, I've provided five extra jobs for people who had been laid off and didn't have jobs. And I have managed to turn my company around simply because I focused on it greatly. And I have managed to um, shred during this time, you know, to 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 get down to a certain percentage of body fat for a photo shoot next week, which is going to help the Sculpted Vegan. And I've managed to launch the Million Dollar Mentor Program. And biggest of all, I've actually managed to, um, I had a very unexpected, because of how we restructured the company whenever we launched, whenever we, um, at the start of the financial year in April, we restructured the company and I sold my my sole trader company to my new limited company, limited liability company, um, which was a very risky decision because I had a half a million pound tax liability if I did that, which needs paid in January. But not only have I managed to turn it all around, but I've managed to um, put away a half a million pounds in tax um, for my tax bill in January. And the reason why I'm telling you this is simply because one of the reasons, I guess, why I'm so exhausted is because I, I feel like I've worked my absolute ass off and I'm almost back to square one because I, I everything I have earned is going to the tax man. And I looked at my business bank account the other day and I was like, why is there so little in my business bank account? Like I have literally knocked my pan in since last March, and I and and part you know everything has gone into the growth of the company, and the rest of it has gone to the fucking inland revenue. <laughs> literally, you have no idea. Most of the money that I have earned in this last year is sitting in an account going to the bloody Inland Revenue. And honestly, that triggered me on Friday. I was like, I don't have the energy to work harder. I don't have, I am done. I don't have the energy to build this business up anymore. I don't have the energy to keep going, which of course I do. I was just absolutely and utterly exhausted. And you know what I needed? I needed a weekend of eating and resting and chilling and relaxing. 
And that's exactly what I gave myself. And I think I'll probably, I'll work hard for this next week until the photo shoot, until the photo shoot happens on Friday. And then I'm going to take the following week completely off the gym, completely off cardio. I'm taking Ryan away to London for his birthday for two days. It's a surprise. He doesn't know. He knows we're going to London, but he doesn't know anything else about it. I have an amazing trip planned. And I'm going to go away and I'm going to take that full week to re relax and recharge so I can come back and feel energized once more because it's easy to look at me over here. And this is not a sympathy vote, by the way. I'm not listening. Oh, I fuck, sculpted vegan. feel really sorry for you, by the way. This is not a sympathy vote. I understand how fortunate I am. I also understand how hard I work for the fortune that I have. But I guess what I want to tell you just to finish off is... There is no there is no mountain that when you climb it and you get to the top that you're going to feel like you have arrived. There is no mountain that when you get there, you will climb to the peak and say, yes, I am happy. I have all the money that I need. My kids are fine. Like there, it's. I always believe that it's, and I heard this from a friend of mine years ago who's very, very wealthy. She said that she, she always felt like it was her job to stand at the top of the mountain waving the white flag and saying, it's not up here. It's not up here to all the people who are climbing that mountain, believing that when they get to the top of it, they're going to be happy. And I, it's not that I want to discourage anyone from going after their goals, but what I want you to realize is that the path is never straight and there'll never be a mountain that when you climb to the top of it, you're going to feel like you have arrived. The, the, like as Ben Sweetland once said, the, it's, it's not the journey. Happiness does not lie in the destination. It's in the journey. Happiness is not a journey. Happiness is not a destination. It is a journey. And I feel most alive whenever I'm launching programs, creating programs, connecting with my tribe, answering questions on Facebook and doing these lives and doing these podcasts. This is what it's all about. Because you you might look at me and say, oh, great, her company has a $4 million turnover this year. But yet, you know, but your, your bank balance doesn't reflect it because half of the money goes to the bloody, you know, goes to the tax man. And then the other half goes to investing and growing in your company. And so, you know, it's not like you arrive to the top of the mountain and say, oh my God, yes, she has this, you know, this uh, this financial success and she should be really happy and she has this amazing body and she should be really happy. I'm shredded to the bone at the minute. I'm like 12% body fat and I still look in the mirror and find faults with my body. I still think I could have worked harder. I still think I could have been leaner. I still think that I, I maybe could have eaten less cake the other week or whatever, you know, it's, you're never going to arrive and feel completely and utterly happy. So all you can do is have compassion for yourself, for your journey and for your struggle in the moment and realize that these the hard times that you go through become your stories in the future. They become your stories that you tell in your business, the stories that you tell your kids and your grandkids. The hard times are important to be able to appreciate the good times. If you didn't have the hard times, you wouldn't appreciate the good times. And if you didn't have the good times, you wouldn't appreciate the hard times. You need to have both the good and the bad, the yin and the yang, the up and the down in order to feel alive. So if you ever feel like you're going through, like I am at the minute, uh, a funk or you're depressed or you're exhausted or you just physically or emotionally feel like you can't go on, just breathe. Just take a step back. Allow yourself some rest. Choose to stay in the moment, to stay focused on the moment and to not allow yourself to get overwhelmed by the situation simply because this too shall pass. I said that to my husband the other day. We were talking about coronavirus and how irritating the whole thing is. And I said to him, you know what, Ryan? I said, like anything in life, this too shall pass. This too shall pass. And he said, yeah, you're right. I know it will. And I said, at some point this will pass and we'll look back and we'll say, wow, do you remember the pandemic when we were all running around wearing masks? <laughs> and the whole thing was completely ridiculous. So, and he said, yeah, it will. So this too shall pass. So what I tell myself when I'm feeling upset or depressed or or anything that I'm feeling at the minute is this too shall pass. I will find the energy and I will, you know, I'm at the, the I'm, I'm actually in an extremely good place in the business now because I do have that money sitting for the tax bill in January and I do have, you know, everything paid off. I have no credit card bills. I have no debts. I have nothing. So I'm, I'm sitting with a blank slate now. Everything that I have, have worked for is to get me into this incredibly financially secure position, even if all the money I have earned has gone to the tax man. But from here, it's only, it, yes, it is uphill from here, but it's a but it's a climb that I'm going to enjoy, but I just need to give myself the rest first. I just need to reset and rest and have a good cry. I think I've cried three times, four times maybe in this last week and I haven't cried in two years. 
And that's okay. I don't judge myself for it and I don't feel bad admitting it. I just accept it as part of the journey and part of life and part of the struggle of being human. And truly, if the struggle didn't exist, then we wouldn't feel alive and we wouldn't feel human. Everyone is human. Emotions are fleeting. And even when I'm exhausted and emotional, underneath it all, I actually feel happy because I know taking care of me is important and I prioritize that above all because you cannot pour from an empty cup. Whenever your cup is full, it can spill over into others, but you cannot pour from an empty cup and you must fill your cup first and you must know that you are worth it. You must know that you are worth it. There is no one else is going to give you your self-worth. It must come from you. And as I say to you every week, I believe in you and I believe that you are worth it and I believe that you can achieve great things. But what you must realize is along the path of achieving great things come the ups and the downs and no one is immune. No matter how happy they seem, how positive they seem, how absolutely incredible their life must seem. Because I know many people look at me and they go, God, I would love to have her life. Well, let me tell you, you might do, it is wonderful, but there is a shitload of responsibility that comes with it. Emotional, financial, physical responsibility that comes with my life. And yes, it is wonderful, but for every yin there is a yang. And sometimes I wish I could go back to having a simpler life, to be honest. But then I think, no, I, abs I absolutely wouldn't. I just have to remember to, to just enjoy and embrace every single part of it and know that this too shall pass and that I am strong and that I am, am worth every ounce of self-care I give myself. And that as long as I stay centered and I stay focused and I stay true to who I am, that's all that really matters in life. It's all that really matters in life. And I hope that I can inspire you to feel the same and to have more of this kind of feeling in your life because it truly is where the magic happens. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. Um, very heartfelt episode for me, just sitting here in my office on a Sunday chatting away to you guys. Um, and I hope that you've enjoyed sharing a little bit of my journey as much as I have enjoyed sharing it all with you. Don't forget about the podcast giveaway. Take a screenshot wherever you listen to this and send it to me as a direct message on Instagram. You could be in with the chance of winning one of our Sculpted Vegan programs. We will do the draw at the start of November. This is Kim Constable on the Kim Constable podcast. Have a wonderful rest of the week wherever you are. I love you. I believe in you. And I will talk to you extremely soon, sooner than you might think, I promise. Okay, love you loads. Take care. Bye for now.